church. Good morning, church. Ah, worked that time. If you could take your seats, that would be fantastic. If you could open up your Bible. If you could open up your Bible. If you could open up your Bible or your Bible app to 1 Kings 14, that would be awesome. I will just repeat that in case you didn't hear that. No, you didn't hear that. So we are going to read together. Well, I'm going to read for you. 1 Kings chapter 14. If you have a Bible app and can choose your translation, it is the NLT that I am reading from. So 1 Kings chapter 14. At that time, Jeroboam's son Abijah became very sick. So Jeroboam told his wife, disguise yourself so that no one will recognize you as my wife. Then go to the prophet Ahijah at Shiloh, the man who told me I would become king. Take him a gift of ten loaves of bread, some cakes and a jar of honey and ask him what will happen to the boy. So Jeroboam's wife went to Ahijah's home at Shiloh. He was an old man now and could no longer see. But the Lord had told Ahijah, Jeroboam's wife will come here pretending to be someone else. She will ask you, about her son, for he's very sick. Give her the answer, I give you. So when Ahijah heard her footsteps at the door, he called out, come in, wife of Jeroboam. Why are you pretending to be someone else? Then he told her, I have bad news for you. Give your husband Jeroboam this message from the Lord, the God of Israel. I promoted you from the ranks of the common people and made you ruler over my people Israel. I ripped the kingdom away from the family of David and gave it to you. But you have not been like my servant David, who obeyed my commands and followed me with all his heart and always did whatever I wanted. You have done more evil than all who lived before you. You have made other gods for yourself and have made me furious with your gold calves. And since you have turned your back on me, I will bring disaster on your dynasty and will destroy every one of your male descendants, slave and free alike, anywhere in Israel. I will burn up your royal dynasty as one burns up trash until it is gone. The members of Jeroboam's family who die in the city will be eaten by dogs, and those who die in the field will be eaten by vultures. I, the Lord, have spoken. Then Ahijah said to Jeroboam's wife, go on home, and when you enter the city, the child will die. All Israel will mourn for him and bury him. He is the only member of your family who will have a proper burial, for this child is the only good thing that the Lord, the God of Israel, sees in the entire family of Jeroboam. In addition, the Lord will raise up a king over Israel who will destroy the family of Jeroboam. This will happen today, even now. Then the Lord will shake Israel like a reed whipped about in a stream. He will uproot the people of Israel from this good land that he gave their ancestors and will scatter them beyond the Euphrates River, for they have angered the Lord with their Asherah poles they have set up for worship. He will abandon Israel because Jeroboam sinned and made Israel sin along with him. So Jeroboam's wife returned to Terzah and the child died just as she walked through the door of her home. And all Israel buried him and mourned for him as the Lord had promised through the prophet Ahijah. The rest of the events in Jeroboam's reign, reign, including all his wars and how he ruled, are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. Jeroboam reigned in Israel 22 years. When Jeroboam died, his son Nadab became the next king. Meanwhile, Rehoboam, son of Solomon, was king in Judah. He was 41 years old when he became king, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city the Lord had chosen from among all the tribes of Israel as the place to honour his name. Rehoboam's mother was Naamah, an Ammonite woman. During During Rehoboam's reign, the people of Judah did what was evil in the Lord's sight, provoking his anger with their sin, for it was even worse than that of their ancestors. 
for they also built for themselves pagan shrines and set up sacred pillars and Asherah poles on every high hill and under every green tree. There were even male and female shrine prostitutes throughout the land. The people imitated the detestable practices of the pagan nations the Lord had driven from the land ahead of the Israelites. In the fifth year of King Rehoboam's reign, King Shishak of Egypt came up and attacked Jerusalem. He ransacked the treasures of the Lord's temple and the royal palace. He stole everything, including all the gold shields Solomon had made. King Rehoboam later replaced them with bronze shields as substitutes, and he entrusted them to the care of the commanders of the guard who protected the entrance to the royal palace. Whenever the king went to the temple of the Lord, the guards would also take the shields and then return them to the guard room. The rest of the events in Rehoboam's reign and everything he did are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Judah. There was constant war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. When Rehoboam died, he was buried among his ancestors in the city of David. His mother was Naamah, an Ammonite woman. Then his son Abijam became the next king. Thanks, Ruth. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, good to see you this morning, uh, whether here in person or online. Just bear with me as I get my notes all sorted. Just realise they're out of order. This will be fun. Um, Hey, uh, if you're visiting, like I said, uh, it is both a joyful um, privilege and also a joyful burden to preach God's Word every week. And this morning, I have the joy to continue our series through 1 Kings. Uh, if you're visiting, once again, uh, my name is Shabu. Uh, if you're online or in person, uh, I'd love to come and meet you at some point. Uh, this morning, I've got a, a pretty big task in front of us. According to our preaching series, we've got to cover 1 Kings chapter 14. 15 and 16. So we'll probably finish at 3 p.m. today. And so I need to have a chat to the lead pastor at some point about this. Now, here's a couple of things I want to lay before us, right? I won't be able to cover every single detail that's in the text or passage that was read to you, but actually particularly in all those three chapters. We also need to remember that the modern Bible that we have, the people at the time didn't have the chapter breakdowns like we do, uh, which are really helpful for us, but at that time, all they had was kings. It wasn't like one and two kings. Now, all that to say, this is what my prayer is, and this is what I hope for us to consider this morning. That is, the Lord who knows and the Lord who sees. The Lord who knows and the Lord who sees. Would you pray with me? Uh, this morning, uh, before I pray, I just want to ask you to ask this question of God, if he hasn't already been speaking to you, which I'm sure he has, through the songs, communion, and now. Maybe even ask the question, Lord, what's on your heart for me this morning? Lord Jesus, we come before your throne as the one who's Lord and risen over all. We bow at your feet this morning, and you see every single heart. You see the kind of weeks we've had, even the very night that we had, or perhaps even this morning. And we thank you that you're meeting with us already as we continue this time of worship under your word. Please continue to guide us. Please continue to lead us. May we walk away knowing more of your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we've already met this King Jeroboam uh, in the previous chapter. If you read about him, like he's the king, that Christ almost reinstall a new religion. It's almost like he's rewriting the history for the people of Israel. And we're in this moment where the kingdom has split. And if you want, once again, go back to the map in the back there and you'll be able to see what that looks like. But this is the moment where this king, his son, has become sick. And the practice of the time uh, for the king was to actually go to the prophet and to ask the prophet what will happen to this child. What's really interesting is that this king didn't go to the various gods that he had replaced God with, but he goes to this prophet that is known to be the Lord's prophet. His strategy, that strategy though, is very interesting, isn't it? 
it also actually reveals the very heart of this king. He's telling his wife to disguise herself, take along items that are quite common in that time to bring before a prophet, and he asks her to go and do something. It's fascinating because you have this wife who's been told to go. Uh, She's not only told to go, but she's told to disguise herself in the hope that he and her can get away with it. And you have this wonderful reminder for us of the beauty of the Lord who knows and the Lord who sees. Have a look with me in verses 4 to 5. And Jeroboam's wife did so. She arose and went to Shiloh. I'm reading from the ESV translation, by the way. You may have a different translation. She arose and went to Shiloh and came to the house of Ajiah. Now, Ajiah could not see, for his eyes were dim because of his age. And the Lord said to Ajiah, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam is coming to inquire of you concerning her son, for he is sick. And thus, thus it shall say to her. So this woman is now going to pretend that she's somebody else and comes towards the prophet. It's really fascinating, isn't it? Uh, That to think, as human beings, we have this tendency, and I think I myself too, or an assumption sometimes, no one will know. No one can see. Another way to put it is that we might, in some way, shape, or form, disguise ourselves to cover up our very real intentions. Perhaps to consider that no one will find out, no one will see. Uh, Friends, this is nothing new in the story of the Bible. Uh, This actual very act began at the very start of the Bible in Genesis chapter 3. Do you remember the story when Adam and Eve, when they sinned, what did they do? They go and hide. What else do they do? They cover themselves. To hide and to cover their sin. Now, this is the moment for us to consider that what sin is, at the heart of it, is to remind you and I that sin is ultimately saying to God that we are in charge. We are God. We are the King. And what we tend to do is we try to hide things from God in the hope that He will never see or never find out. But how can we hide things from the God of the universe? He sees all and he knows all. So this king, a cowardly king, I would say, sends his wife to do the dirty work, hopes he can get away with it. But God knows, and not only that, the Lord sees. Now, did you even see the detail in the Bible version that I read to you? The prophet Ajiah, what is it described? He could not see due to his blindness because of his age. Now, all these details are there for a purpose, for the original hearers and for us as well, that you can't actually hide from God. In particular, you can't hide the very motives of your heart from the very God of the universe. He sees all and He knows all. And the action and the motive is confronting for us and for the audience then and for us to see that this is what's going on. And this is this moment where the prophet confronts what's really happening. Did you see that in verse 6? When Ajiah heard the sound of her feet, as she came into the door, he said, Come in, wife of Jeroboam. Why do you pretend to be another? For I'm charged with unbearable news. This blind prophet can see better because it's been revealed to him what's going on than this king and queen who are desiring to hide their very actions and their very motives. They pretend. Now, friends, this is nothing new, right? This is nothing new that as you read the story of the Bible, this idea of blindness, this idea of trying to hide from God is nothing new. It's really shown so powerfully in the very Gospels. In that moment, do you remember when Jesus is healing different people? He heals blind people. Really fascinating, right? The blind people can't physically see Jesus, but they know who Jesus is. But the ones who don't know Jesus or don't recognize him are the ones who should know. And this is what sin does. It blinds us. It blinds us from the reality of thinking that God cannot see, that God cannot know. And this is why, even in the blind people, they would cry out, Son of David, have mercy. And like I said, when sin is active in our hearts, often our temptation might be to go, well, no one really knows. No one really sees. Perhaps I will cover it up with this way or that way. I mean, it's only a white lie, it won't hurt anyone. Perhaps you've heard this. 
This is the reality, right? When sin is something that comes into our lives and we become so blind to it, or perhaps even apathetic to it, and we don't take the seriousness of it. And this is the beauty of who God is, that thankfully, that He knows and He sees. Uh, friends, if you're someone who's exploring the Christian faith, this is actually very gracious of God, believe it or not. That God is the one who sees, God is the one who knows, and not only that, God is the one who knows the very posture of your heart. You can't hide it from Him. And if you're a follower of Christ, this is the moment for us to ask brothers in Christ, are there things in our lives, are there things in my life, are we trying to hide or pretend that no one else knows and maybe perhaps God doesn't know? Or sisters in Christ, are there things in our lives that we're hiding of who we are or pretending to be? But this is the moment also to be challenged in the way that this king uses his wife to sin, it's a wonderful reminder that it, it's, it's also for us to consider in any way in our own lives, in our homes, in our workplaces, that we're trying to call someone else to do the wrong thing, ultimately sin against the God of the universe. But I want you to know, this, that passage here in front of us is encouraging, all of this is encouraging because this is a reminder, the Lord knows, the Lord sees, and also the Lord says, cry out for mercy. All this sneaky, sneaky work that's going on, it's revealing Jeroboam's heart, but not only that, that his sin will have consequences. Now, what's his sin? What is it? Is it about telling his wife to disguise herself? No, have a look with me again in chapter 14, verses 7 to 10. Go tell Jeroboam, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, because I exalted you from among the people and made you a leader over my people Israel and tore the kingdom away from the house of David. Remember, this is the split. And gave it to you, and yet you have not been like my servant David, who kept my commandments and followed me with all his heart, doing only that was which is right in my eyes. But you have done evil above all who were before you and gave, have gone and made for yourself other gods and metal images, provoking me to anger and have cast me behind your back. Therefore, behold, I'll bring harm upon you, the house of Jeroboam, and will cut off from Jeroboam every male, both bond and free in Israel, and will burn up the house of Jeroboam as a man burns up dung until it is all gone. Whoa. To feel the holiness of God and who He is, that you cannot hide from Him, and there are consequences. And this very sin, and the reason for it is that the consequence is that the Lord knows, the Lord will judge, not only that Jeroboam, this king, uh, the visual picture is he's turned his back away from God and not even looking, can't even be bothered. It's like throwing him off. And a person, this person who sinned does not just impact him, it's impacted his whole line all around him. And this is a particular context, by the way. This is for this particular king, just to clarify that. That his whole lineage, humanly speaking, will end. Will end. But there's this hint of God's grace and mercy, even the very passage. Did you see that? Remember the son? The child who fell sick? It's a, it's a visual picture of the impact of sin felt keenly on the life of this child, for the very actions of the father, but not only the very actions of the world in the sinful world, that death is there. Yet in this death, there's something that's really fascinating, displaying the very character of who God is. Have a look again in verse 13. And God says, through the prophet, and all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him, for he only of Jeroboam shall come to the grave because in him there is found something pleasing to the Lord, the God of Israel, and the house of Jeroboam. And another translation called the NET puts it this way, For he, that is the child, the only one in whom the Lord God of Israel found anything good. See, in the midst of the Jeroboam's evil and deception, and in the way of thinking that he can hide and get away with it, in this moment, there's this gracious picture of God that says he only sees literally good, this child. 
Now, the text itself doesn't give us all the details. The passage doesn't go into all the details, and perhaps you can read commentaries about all of this, but this is a reminder to say that God knows, God sees. One of the clues that some argue for, which I think I understand why, would be the very name that he's given. It's up here on the screen. Just to let you know, I'm not some Hebrew scholar. You can look up a a Bible dictionary for this. His name is Abba'iwan, or Abba'jam, but notice the translation. He's talking about my father, the sea of the, my father. Another translation puts it this way, it's saying Jehovah is my father, Yahweh. It's interesting the way that this child is named. Now, he might have named it after the very own gods that he's calling to worship, but the very picture that's given to us is this child is unlike his father. It's really, I think, a whisper of grace that God is unpacking, that in the very brokenness and in the very sin and in the deceit, there is very hope. God is the ultimate Father who knows. This death of this child, friends, is to confront the people of the time, even for us. It's to cause the hearers then and to us to realize the impact of sin is not just personal, it impacts others around you. Even those who, in God's eyes, He sees as good. This child dies. It was a punishment for Jeroboam's sin, not for the child's sin. It's an echo as well throughout the Bible. Do you know the story of the great King David when he uh, committed adultery against Bathsheba and what happened to that child? Here is another echo of that. But here in the midst of this, Jeroboam is given this confronting picture that all of his generation be wiped out. It's pretty confronting, like as I read to you. But here in this moment, there's this this picture of grace, the Lord God who sees, the Lord God who knows, and the Lord God who says that all of Israel shall mourn his death. It's a picture of he's the only one will have a fitting burial. It's a reminder that sin impacts not just individually but others, but also that sin is something that we are called to mourn, not just brush off. See, the Lord sees both the deception and the rebellious, and also He sees those who are good. Both lives are impacted by the brokenness and the rejection of God's loving rule and authority. And in this context, they're led to worship other gods. And this is also the truth and the reality on this side of eternity, right? See, this passage for us, you and I, is a moment to consider in front of us. If you're someone who's exploring the Christian faith, all of your life, the Lord knows and sees. Everything. Even those things that you think that no one else knows about. Now, I'm not saying this to show you that God's some creepy kind of guy looking into your life, no. This is to remind you and I, the God of the universe knows, the God of the universe knows... The God of the universe invites you to come and seek Him and turn. Because you and I have all turned away from God's loving rule and command. Our very heart's posture is to hide, to put on a disguise. But you may think to yourself, you're good, but you're not. You and I are not good. There is only one, and it is God who determines who is good in His grace. So, this is no different for those of us who are followers of Jesus, right? You and I might be able to delete our web browsing history, but we can't hide or masquerade before the God of the universe, the one who knows all and sees all. But do you see the very grace in this very passage that the call is for this king to keep the commands of the Lord? With what? With all of their heart. To keep God's commands with all of their heart. It's that moment you and I go, isn't that hard to do? Do you find that hard? To keep all of God's commands with all of your heart. It's a daily battle. See, but this this picture here, this daily battle, is also to keep, to remind them that they had to call to keep the commands, but it's also revealing their very heart that they can't. And this is the moment for those of us who are followers of Christ, we're reminded our hearts can easily be deceived by many things. 
And you know, the very passages in front of us in 1 Kings, you know, like I said, we've got 1 Kings, uh, all the various chapters, and it almost feels like they're just jumping from one to the other. You've got to remember, this happened over a significant amount of years. Sin and its corruption doesn't happen overnight. It's one compromise after one compromise and one compromise, and slowly it's like erosion, just erodes away in your life and my life. So the question you and I can ask is, so where are we masquerading followers of Christ? Brothers or sisters? I don't know. Is the Holy Spirit pressing into something today? Is is He challenging you? But this is also a picture that there is hope. See, if you're new to the Christian faith, you might be even coming to the church today, maybe you're watching us online, and you might assume that the Christian group are the kind of people who pretend that they've all got it together. We don't. I've said this before. We don't. And I've said the term that we're a glorious mess because of the grace of God. This week, John and I had the great joy to catch up with a couple from our church, and we talked about multiple things. But one of the things as I drove away, one of the comments that really stayed in my head went along like this. Should be, we are all sinners if it wasn't for the grace of God extended to us. You and I would be lost we would indeed still today have the very reason to mourn. The Lord knows, the Lord sees, and it's the Lord's word that will always stand throughout history. So from this moment in chapter 14, and then moving on, you've already maybe picked it up, the reality of its impact moves from just one individual, and the very audience at the time would have been the people in exile. They're seeing and experiencing the very reality of all this rebellion and sin as God judges them, sends them to exile. It's almost that like they're seeing the history real of their nation. But in chapters 15 and 16, if you have a quick squiz for me, there's this common phrase, if you haven't already picked it up, that comes up. That is, if you insert... The king's name, whoever they are, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Impact, eventually they die. Right? So most of the kings in this section, and the reoccurring thing that you often see, is that there is judgment against them, because they have committed evil against the Lord. The Lord knows, the Lord sees. This very evil leads their people into worship of other gods, which is totally against what God has called them to do, and to pursue their own selfish desires, to make up their own gods for their own purposes. Their evil causes them to blind them to perhaps even consider they've got away with it. You can't get away with it. The Lord knows, the Lord sees, and the Lord will judge. Yet in the midst of all of this, two things stand out. If you have a look with me quickly in chapter 15, verses 4 to 5. This is what it says, Nevertheless, for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem, setting up his son after him and establishing Jerusalem because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah and the Hittite. These are all, throughout the Old Testament, what I would describe as glimmers of grace, glimmers of hope. Despite of sin, the Lord who knows, the Lord who sees, the Lord's plans will be established. The Lord is the one who establishes a lamp. It's like a light. The other way of reading that language is the dynasty or the dynasty, because the Lord is the one who kept His word. That Lord's plan will not be hindered. The ultimate plan through his King David was actually part of a bigger purpose through the story of the Bible. The Lord knows that his word will be established. And also the Lord knows that there is an ultimate greater need and he is the one who will always provide the way. And the other glimmer that we see, it's like almost this little king that's mentioned very briefly and it's really amazing that in the midst of this, there's this other glimmer. Do you see this other king? His name is Asa in chapter 15 in Judah. He did what? He did what was right in the Lord's sight. And he leads to renewal. He moves away from the worship of idols and and sex slaves for the idolatry that was there. And he's calling them to put it away. And it's destroyed. And all his life, he's true to the Lord. Verse 14 of 15. 
these little hints that he didn't get it all right either, like he left some of the ashes up as well. But it's to communicate to the hearers then, and despite of the brokenness of the unfaithful king and the people, God is the one who sees both good and evil. His purposes will be achieved. He will always be the one who keeps his word and his promises. Do you see, friends? Do you hear the Lord sees, the Lord knows? The Lord who will always ultimately judge rightfully. The other striking thing in all of these chapters is the striking comment of how they either died or slept with their fathers. I don't know if you've got one of these posters or have seen it. It's up here on the screen for you that I made this myself, so I'm not sure how it will go. It's one of those, you know, repeat posters. Have you seen that? Uh, you know, you, you sleep, you eat, you work, and there's a black that's meant to say repeat. Uh, the next one is you feed your baby, you change your nappies, you feed your baby, change your nappies, repeat. There's no sleep for those people at the moment. <laughs> there are those of us who are in a different season of life. We sleep, we go caravanning, then we check our health to make sure we're okay, repeat. <laughs> All right? Not looking at anyone at the moment. I don't know if you ever experienced this. A friend of mine put it this way, Kings is like this, it's up here on the screen. Next one, sorry, Anne, thank you. You live, sin, die, repeat. It's almost like this constant theme throughout Kings. And that's also a picture of reality of the the, the danger and, and the dark picture that is there for all of us if it wasn't for the grace of God. And this is the moment, perhaps you might be reading this and going, well, what hope is in there? Now, we're a little bit spoiled. We've got all of the Bible, right? But for the people at that time, if you can imagine in exile going, oh man, what is going on? What hope is there? But in these passages, we're given a glimpse of God's grace already in all these chapters. There's this child that God saw as good. And it's a wonderful whisper, I think, that God knows that through the line of David would come another greater child, the one who is indeed truly perfect, the one who is truly, truly good. This child would be born out of the line of David as God had intended. This is God's ultimate plan. The one who came to this world because we all have done what is evil in the sight of the Lord. You and I have worshipped many things except God as we ought to. So Jesus is sent, the one who is the Son of God, the one who is indeed truly good, the one whom the Father is truly pleased in, the one constantly said no perfectly to sin. Do you remember one of the greatest temptations that Satan gave to Jesus while he was here on this earth and he was sent to the desert to be tempted? It's in Gospel of Matthew chapter 4. It's up here on the screen. The devil takes him to the high places and the mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in glory. And said to him, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus rightly says, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. The devil left. Angels come minister to him. Jesus is the perfect one. He is God himself, the one who is worthy to be worshipped. The one who tasted both the goodness and pleasing Um, affirmation of the Father when He was baptized, but also tasted the judgment and wrath that was due for you and me on that cross as He dies. He's truly God. He's the one who is perfect, the one who the Father looked at and said, I am pleased, the one who was willing to go to the cross for you and I. But he's also the one who called people to true worship. Do you remember throughout the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, you know, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. I tell you, if you look at any woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery in your heart. You've heard it said, do not be angry. I tell you, if you have any kind of anger in your heart, it's like you're murdering them. God's standards are high and Jesus says, look to me, I see follow me. Yet we know that because of Christ, we are so 
so privileged, as Mike already shared this morning, as we reflect on Easter, that because of Christ, because of the cross, because Jesus is resurrected, we have a way back to the Father every time. Every time. Always. When you and I sin. Because He sees, He knows, He's faithful, and He calls us to turn, and this side of the cross and the empty tomb is still the same, Christians. The call is still the same, to live holy lives, but through the power of the Spirit. The the language in the New Testament is always active against sin. It always says things like, flee, resist, cut off, to confess, not only to God, to one another. But then God says, through Christ, I will send the helper, the one who helps us. So when, not if, but when you and I sin, we can come to the Father through Christ and seek forgiveness because He is what? He's just and faithful to forgive us. So I was considering what to share here as you kind of think, okay, well, okay, thanks, Shibu. What was that all about? Where do we head from here? Here's something for us to consider. Even this morning, where is the Lord shining His gracious, loving light into your life? Are there things that you're holding on to that you might just need to confess to the Lord? Perhaps there are things that we're building, idols of any kind, to replace God as the center of our life. Because we can't hide things. You may be hiding things from each other, but you can't hide things from the Lord. And perhaps He's inviting you to come back to the wonderful, gracious truth of the cross. To confess. Did you know when God convicts us of our sin, that's His grace? Better conviction than condemnation from the God of the universe. See, to those of us who consider... God is a God who's constantly peering into my life. I just want you to know He's doing that because He wants to save you and reveal His mercy and grace to you. Because you and I need reminded that the gospel reminds us we've all missed the mark. We've all missed the mark. Because He alone is good. And because of Christ, though, this means that if we are His, God sees us through Jesus. And in light of Christ, we are good. We are forgiven. There is no longer condemnation. So when He calls to turn, to press into those areas of our lives, it's out of His love towards us to refine us, to change us, and we become more like His Son. I just want to share a couple of pictures up here on the, on the screen for you. The first one, I think what happens is this idea, what I would call a, an understanding of the gospel, or an understanding of a cross-centered life. It is someone who gives their life to Christ for the very first time. It might be a moment, it might be a journey, whatever it might be. The line up the top says, growing awareness of God's holiness. The arrow going down says, God's awareness of my sinfulness. What this means is that we look at the cross, we accept the cross. But when there's this sense of God's grace not being enough, our danger is to lead to religion, to moralism, to self-justification, legalism, and pride. What means is the cross just stays the same. The other way to go is, if we don't see the seriousness of sin, what we end up doing is we end up staying in guilt, we end up staying being fearful of God, that He's waiting there with a whacking stick, we're constantly feeling ashamed, we're constantly feeling insecure, and we're constantly clinging on to despair. The next um, um, screen. But what happens is, because of the cross, because of grace, God invites us to look at life a different way. This is what I call the cross-centered life. What this means is that the grace of God and the gospel continues to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. What that means is there's a growing awareness of God's holiness, which means that because He loves you, you want to say no to sin through the power of the Spirit. This means that those moments when He convicts you, 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 you repent, you ask forgiveness, and you are assured that He's adopted you and He loves you. And He invites you to see life in this way. What could that look like? Well, here's a suggestion for you. There are many things that you can do, but here's a suggestion that I found helpful in my own life. The next picture. We use this for training with pastors in an organization I get to work with. We have the Holy Spirit. He's in us. That's one. Two, firstly and foremostly, is to go, well, know your sin, to own it. What are you thinking? What do you need to confess? For my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Then Next thing to do is to understand your heart, to ask, well, it's not about just doing the wrong thing. Well, what's underneath that? What's the root of that? 
it's a process. It takes time. It takes reflection to search and ask God, search my heart, reveal to me. And then because of the Spirit, because of His grace, He says, confess it to me. But perhaps you might also need to grieve. Some of us are really good at saying God's grace and we don't grieve. Some of us grieve too much and don't just rest in God's grace. And there's always this pendulum that we all run before, right? God invites us to confess. Then as the Spirit reveals this thing, then we come back to the gospel because of Christ in us. For this is for those of us who are followers of Christ. And this is the moment where at this church you'll hear us often saying, preach the gospel to yourself. What that means is to remind yourself of who you are in Christ and therefore this is why you're called to live in a particular way. And then we live in hope that there's a day coming we will no need to fight against all this sin. But we live in hope that God is changing us. God is the work of changing. And He's changing you and I every day. Now I've kind of gone fast forwarded through this picture I will, if you want, come and chat to me afterwards. Friends, it's an invitation to you and I to know the Lord knows. The Lord knows. The Lord sees. And He invites you and I to come to Christ. And this is a wonderful assurance in the day and time that you and I live, where often there are kings and emperors and queens who pretend that they can get away with lots of things. The Lord knows. And he sees, and he will righteously judge. His conviction to us is his grace. And so he invites us to come through the Lord Jesus, to know that he does love us because of him. And he sees us through the light of the gospel. The Lord knows, the Lord sees. Would you join with me in prayer? Lord, as the music team comes up now, as I was reminded of in this morning at the 9 a.m. service, help us to take time to be holy through the power of the Spirit, to talk oftenly with you, to abide in your ways, to feed on your word, to make friends of God's children. Help those who are weak, forgetting in nothing his blessing to seek. Lord, help us through the power of the Spirit to be holy, the world rushes on. Help us not to spend time in secret, but to actually be spending time in secret with you alone by looking to you, Jesus, to you, our good and gracious Saviour. And so we sing this song in response. In your name we pray. Amen.